Welcome back, friends, to our eighth week. Uh, and our uh, topic this time around uh, is hope, uh, our, uh, our final video. And again, I hope you find the outline there and can follow along at what we're uh, up to. Um, I want to begin, as perhaps you could suspect that I would want to begin, by sort of giving a broad view of hope. Um, when we think of it in this term, maybe we think of it as sort of an existential, you know, what is our ultimate hope? I don't want to begin there. I want to point to the fact that hope has a lot of functions in our life and has a lot of levels uh, in our life and society. Uh, <clears throat> hopes that we, uh, you know, want to build toward with regularity. Uh, I have got uh, diet and exercise constantly. I'm doing that out of hope <laughs> that things will change or at least <laughs> remain the same for some period of time. Uh, we have hopes about uh, you know, our financial future, we have hopes about health, and, we, uh, and so we, we build toward those hopes and sometimes they're a little bit out of our control, but nevertheless, it's things that we can build toward. Um, and that is uh, how hope can you know, function uh, in our lives. Uh, a, a second way uh, <clears throat> it does uh, hopes are a part of shared communities and shared societies. If, we're, um, if we belong to an organization, we might be rounded up occasionally and, and be refreshed in the vision of, uh, of, the, of the organization, and that's a good thing. What are our shared hopes there? Uh, we're in, um, you know, in a political season in the United States. We're asking what are our hopes concerning the United States. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and world peace and a few other things like that. So uh, the shared hopes are an important element of how we go about our day-to-day our -day life, <clears throat> although they may pop up uh, at different times in, in different ways. Uh, hopes uh, regarding the nature of life in general, uh, then that does begin, begin to be sort of existential or you know, sort of an ultimate question, is, is life worthwhile? Uh, and here, uh, I, I like to think about the way hope, in fact, ends up giving meaning to the moment. Do I have a reason to, uh, to wake up and get out of bed and, uh, and go forward? If I do, that's called hope. It's because I hope today will have something uh, good about it or I'll be able to contribute, uh, or, uh, or, or I'm, I'm looking forward to something happening, or there's a process I want to be involved in because it's going to be good. And so there is meaning to the day because there is hope. And right there probably is the, the question that gets touched. What, what happens when there is no hope? What happens when a situation is hopeless, absolutely hopeless? Uh, what happens to the individual? Um, I think that's the same question as what happens to an individual when they find no meaning in life. So hope is, in one sense, something we deal with all the time, uh, sometimes very uh, um, in light ways. Um, I, um, you know, Christmas comes around and um, used to be, when I was a kid, I'd hope to have a really great present. I'd hope to have the, 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 the <laughs> the most amazing present on my block, okay? Uh, nowadays, my hope for Christmas is <laughs> I'll be able to find an amazing present, maybe give a present better than <laughs> I'm going to receive and get some credit for that. Uh, that's a hope. <laughs> and uh, maybe I need to build toward it <laughs> in, in legitimate ways. Other kinds of hopes, you know, uh, will mom be around uh, to celebrate her, her next birthday or, or not? Uh, will my son find um, a job uh, that's going to satisfy him in the long run and in the process? Also friends and a spouse. Uh, hope works on so many ways and sometimes it, it suddenly touches us very deeply. And so that's, that's what I want to look at. Hope as a general human reality. Uh, and um, you're already thinking of ways if you're listening, already thinking of ways in which you encounter that uh, in your own professional uh, environment. So let me begin point number two now in our outline uh, to look more deeply at the question of the, the connection between hope and the meaning of, of life. Um, meaning of life is a sort of a present reality. 
what, what am I thinking can happen now? Hope is about the future. And uh, so we have to make the connection because, I mean, the first thing to say is that hope really is about uh, a clear future. We, uh, we want to see <clears throat> something happen. And so, uh, so we hope that it will occur. I will also make the case that it's firmly connected with our past and our present. Our hopes arise out of the present moment that we have. Um, sometimes they arise out of, you know, the, the positive things we've experienced and also the negative things. Uh, what did I experience as a kid that I want my kids to experience? And there, so, so hope comes from uh, something good in the past. What did I experience as a kid that I want to protect my kids from experiencing? Uh, there too, something negative in the past becomes uh, something uh, uh, that I'm hoping for. Um, so another fascinating element about this, I, I love this, I love to think about this paradigm and we're gonna connect it with uh, scripture as well. How easy it is, I think, for us in our society to skip over today. Uh, we worry about the past, we hope about the future, uh, and today we just rush, rush, rush to try to make it all happen. Um, the, 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 the saying that uh, we hear, uh, you know, stop and smell the roses is, uh, is a good one, although uh, perhaps it doesn't have enough beef in it. Well, stop and smell the beef. It doesn't have substance enough to really make us stop and, uh, and ask what the present moment is all about. I would think for nurses, you are trained partly to resist all of that. Uh, as you walk into a clinical uh, situation and you are in the present moment. I, I think that's one of the great uh, gifts of nursing and of nurse training is that uh, you, in a, in a sense, bring the present moment to people who are floundering with the future. Uh, and so in that way, I think we see these connections. Um, and I want to, you to think about that as we explore it now in relation to, um, to a, a scripture. It's something that if you know uh, much about the, the Bible, you're aware of, uh, of this passage. Uh, I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 13, uh, a letter Paul wrote to the community at Corinth. And in the middle of it, he was, uh, you know, they were, um, they had some issues. Uh, they were, there was a lot of competition there, apparently. It sounded like uh, there were groups that were trying to get on, you know, getting ahead of other groups. And, uh, and so in this, epistle as he's talking about it, he stops and he talks about uh, the importance of love, uh, the, the power of love, and in fact that that's the, the heart of what we do. So uh, I'm just going to read uh, uh, verses 11 through 13. It's a, it's a beautiful chapter. If you've never looked at 1 Corinthians 13, uh, take a look. But it ends uh, with these words uh, here as I'll read. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. So let me pull that passage out a little bit. Uh, Paul has been talking about love and he says we need to come to a maturity. We need to come to uh, a reality of the present moment. We did things when we were kids, but now uh, we have to understand what is on us and, and, and in front of us today. Uh, so the past is there, but he says it's it, now we have to grow out of it. And he says the future is there as well. Uh, he, he says we see in a mirror dimly, and, and here the uh, exegetes will tell us uh, we see God, we see the future, we see what's coming dimly, as if it were a mirror. Now this is the days in which mirrors <laughs> were not as burnished as well as they are today. So you sort of could tell whether your hair was... Uh, straight or not, but maybe not clearly. Yeah, uh, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see God face to face. So the future is there. The future is in the hands of the Lord. 
So he says, uh, we have these three things, faith and hope and love. And the greatest is love. So taking that phrase and connecting it with sort of the paradigm that I was rep representing, that there's a past and there's a present and the future, and, and they're connected, but, but where are they? Where's the emphasis? Where, where are the connections? Faith is, uh, may I suggest, see what you think about this, uh, is, is how we come to the present moment given what we know in the past. We, we, we've learned things in the past, and so we bring them in faith to the present moment. Uh, we have known the world is in such and such a way. We've known that we can help in such and such a way in the past. And so we come to a particular moment with faith that, that it can also happen now. Faith brings us with confidence to the present moment. Hope, again, is obviously about the future. We hope that certain things will happen. We hope that uh, our uh, clients will get well. Uh, we hope that, again, all the things I talked about, we hope that life will turn out well and that's about the future. Where does love uh, connect with that? Love, may I suggest, is unambiguously in the present moment. <laughs> love is what happens now. Uh, I think of a, uh, a Dear Abby column um, where uh, you know, somebody wrote and said, Tell everyone they should uh, let their, their mom know they love her before, their pa before she passes. My mom passed away, and I never got to finally tell her how much I really loved her. Yes, that's true. You can't tell someone, um, you know, um, yes, you know, I, I, I loved you. <laughs> that has no point, uh, unless it also means I love you. Uh, and, and, and you can't tell someone I'm going to love you tomorrow uh, although perhaps you can ask uh, the question, uh, will you love me tomorrow? That's an old song. Love, I'm suggesting, is something that can only happen now. It's something that we encounter. So write the letter now. Make the phone call now. Uh, connect now. And text, you know, wow, so many ways we have of throwing a heart in there and saying, I love you. Uh, and, and the moment is made. The moment is made. Um, of those three then, faith kind of focused in the past and, and what we bring, hope uh, in the future, uh, and, uh, and love. And according to Paul, the greatest is love. The greatest is love. What that exactly means is something we have to think about because Paul didn't say, I'll tell you exactly why the greatest is love except that he was telling a community that was uh, roiled. He was saying, that's where your hope will begin, is if you come together in love. And it points to this uh, insight. And again, I'm offering it to you to think about what, what this may mean, and if you find it to be helpful or true. That uh, as we are anchored now in, in love and in the realities of the present moment, as we're anchored now in, uh, in, in who we are and what our relationships are, uh, we uh, find ourselves ready for the future. The future then arises out of that. All that we have in the past comes together in how we are managing today and how we are enjoying today. And all of the future results in how, what, what changes occur to us today, what decisions we make, uh, positive or negative, and out of the moment, and Paul would say, uh, especially out of the moment as it is uh, infused with love, their hope arises, their, the future arises. Uh, so that's something to challenge me and to, and to challenge you. Uh, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest is love. So uh, point D then under uh, uh, this connection, um, if that's true and in that sense, uh, again, uh, we sort of reiterate uh, hope has a large role in establishing the quality of life now. If I am worried about the future, if I'm worried about our financial future as a couple, if I worry that our income doesn't meet our expenses and we might lose the house, 
uh, if I worry um, about something like that, it gives me anxiety today. It makes today a little bit worse. Uh, if on the other hand, those things are not a worry, I can enjoy the moment and I can, uh, uh, whatever it is in my work or in my relaxation uh, or, or in recreation, uh, everything comes in a beautiful way. Yeah, it happens in so, so many different ways. Uh, <clears throat> again, I'm thinking of a story uh, that my dad told. Uh, he was a pastor. Uh, and um, the story of a, a young couple getting married. And um, the wedding was set, all of that. And then their, their, uh, one of the kids' grandmothers uh, passed away just a, a, a week before. So the question is, do we cancel the wedding um, because grandma passed away? And the whole family said, absolutely not. It's all a celebration. Grandma was great. We celebrate her past. She continues to have impact just as we think of her. We celebrate her now. And in the wedding, we celebrate all of that, the way that works in the future. And Dad loved that because uh, he felt it to be such a, a powerful uh, example of the way affirmation uh, and, 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 and affirmation of love in the moment uh, can cause everything uh, to be strengthened and, uh, and, to, and to be assur assured and, uh, and asserted. All right. I'm going to mention the work of uh, Jürgen, Jürgen Moltmann, whose uh, his name is there in the uh, uh, outline. You'll notice he has an umlaut over the first U. <laughs> Tells you he's German. Uh, in 1967, he wrote a, a, a book called The Theology of Hope. This was his first uh, the theology book, and he has subsequently followed it up. He's still writing, uh, and sometimes he and his wife uh, partner to, uh, to write. And his whole emphasis is, is the fact that uh, religion is best understood in terms of its hope. Uh, a, a powerful idea, one that um, might challenge uh, some of the things we, we, we talk about. Uh, it was important for him as a German in 1967 uh, to talk about hope because he found his society still struggling with their role in the Holocaust and in the revelation that occurred at the end of World War II when the Americans and other uh, uh, troops went in and found uh, the horrible things that had been accomplished among uh, the Jewish Germans at the time. Uh, and, uh, and getting over that, uh, Moltmann found that he couldn't get over that, that he was stuck in the past. And so in his theology, he reached out to the future and he said, one thing we can know is that as we move forward, we will find God. We will see him face to face. We see it in a mirror dimly now, but we shall see God. Uh, it hit a, a note uh, for a lot of people, uh, and it was an interesting take on, on theology. Uh, let's look at hope as the, in fact, of the focus of, uh, of what the Bible talks about, uh, both the Old Testament and the New, and he's done a good job at, at bringing that out. It attra attracted wide appreciation uh, for its reach uh, for the future, um, and it's also garnered uh, some criticism. Um, if we spend too much time worrying about the past and uh, skipping over the present to ask, us, ask God to take us to the future as fast as he can, <laughs> please. Uh, do we miss God in the present moment? I think there's probably a criticism there. I agree uh, that there's a criticism. And I mean, the one thing I might say to Moltmann <laughs> the next time I see him, <laughs> is to say, you know, Paul said the greatest was not hope, but the greatest was love. Um, isn't the, isn't the, what God does now, uh, to what extent is that really the most uh, foundational thing uh, that we can, we can find? But a fascinating uh, lens and, and one that has caused uh, the theolo theological community to really think about the place of hope. And again, uh, hope, hope as, as the meaning of life. Uh, so our second point there under the hope as grounded uh, in presence, in knowledge and love. 
Um, knowledge and love is a, an echo from a previous lecture uh, that I did uh, when I talked about human needfulness and the gift of needfulness that God provides, that it's a gift. Neediness turns out to be our best friend because out of our needfulness comes our need for knowledge of God and each other and love of God and each other. And in that sense, it comes, uh, comes meaning. Out of our needfulness as human beings, as that's satisfied, as that's channeled into, uh, into a good uh, uh, work like relationships and stewardship, as we talked about in the Imago Dei, as that's challenged into, into uh, uh, helpful ways, um, it becomes uh, very, uh, uh, it gives us meaning. It gives us meaning and it puts us in a processes where there is both a present and a hope. So yeah, I'm saying that hope is, is, is grounded in what we know now. It, it may, that may be counterintuitive. Um, you know, let's talk about now and then let's talk about the future. Uh, but I'm, I want to tie those lines together. And I think partly because I think my, part of my motivation is that nurses deal so much with both. Uh, they, they deal so much in the, in the anxiety and the possibilities of the present moment, and at the same time, uh, deal constantly with, uh, uh, with the questions. What's the prognosis? What's the hope? How many days? How long? Uh, what will happen? Will I, ha will I be permanently disabled? Uh, what can I look at in the future? Uh, and uh, all of that is uh, it's there. So I'm suggesting, uh, second point there, the best discernment of reality uh, comes from the present moment. The, breath, the best discernment of reality and therefore the future comes from the present moment. You know that, we know that. Um, we can talk about hope uh, and, and the direction of hope and the possibility of hope uh, if we don't ignore what's here and now. Uh, uh, David Hubbard, who was the president of Fuller Seminary for many years, uh, said that the best advice uh, to resolve any problem uh, or any, uh, anything that needed to, to, to have some administrative work or some planning. Uh, he was a golfer and his favorite line was, uh, play it where it lies, play the ball where it lies. Uh, if you wanna get it in the cup, ask where it is now. <laughs> and uh, at, that's far reaching. I haven't come to the end of, of that advice yet. <laughs> Because it, it, it's such a big question of, okay, if that's the problem, where does it lie? Outside of my wishes where it would lie, my, my, my concerns, my, my, uh, maybe my, my uh, optimism, my, my pessimism, uh, where does the ball lie? Therefore, because of the present moment, what can we say and how can we help create uh, the future? And... Um, if all that comes together, and again, if we're talking about what this means for human beings, then uh, what the present moment means and how we decide where the ball lies is going to be a lot in terms of relationship and readiness for relationship, uh, openness to each other, uh, openness to hear the realities of the present moment. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of, of, of logistics as well. There are just technical elements of where, where we're at, where our patient is at, where I'm at. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, there, I think, is, uh, is where the future uh, begins to emerge in the reality of, of that present moment. Let me give an example, uh, perhaps the most difficult one for all of us. Uh, and that is our, uh, our fear of death, something that uh, nurses live and walk with all the time. And uh, uh, I'm not sure we theologians do that uh, as, uh, as often as you do or as well as you do. Um, how can we think of hope, right? If there, if there is no hope in that sense, if, uh, if death is coming in, uh, as a pastor friend of mine used to say, he says, none of us get out of this alive. Yeah. Um, 
For Christians, uh, there's a great answer, a powerful answer, and it's a true one. And that is uh, that God's love, as he brings it to us and sustains us with it moment by moment, God's love is the river which takes us day by day, moment by moment, across the, the border of death when, where life ends and into whatever future lies ahead. Uh, it's, it's God in the present moment that confirms uh, that, that there is something to hope for. It's, uh, it's God um, as we know him now, right? as we know him now, or as we need to know him now, or as we need to realize we need to know him a little better. This God promises that there is meaning in death and, and in the life beyond whatever that may entail. It's not a, a bad question either for those who are not Christian, who don't have the Christian commitment and, and uh, haven't committed to uh, understood, understand that they live within that reality, that, uh, uh, that religion. And there are many uh, ways in which, just simply from a humanist perspective, um, the reality of human love as it is with us day by day, even up to the moment of death, is itself uh, the affirmation that, uh, that life has meaning. And there are suggestions, and I was reading the paper just last week, uh, some humanists who are willing to say it can't possibly stop, not because we're religious, but because we're humanists. There's got to be something more. Um, yeah. I don't know how you pin that down. Uh, but what we're saying is this. The power of the present moment should not be underestimated as we look at the most difficult issues uh, of the future and, and of hope. All right, let's look at, uh, as Jesus, at Jesus and, uh, and how he, uh, he works within that paradigm and perhaps even lifts it up uh, in, in special ways. Uh, Jesus uh, is described as the hope of the world. <laughs> Jesus is the one who uh, embodies uh, the fact that life is, is good and therefore there is hope. He embodies the fact that, that there is release of the prisoners. There is, uh, uh, there is relief from physical ill. Uh, there is relief from oppression, so, social and political. Uh, and, uh, and that there is, in fact, uh, not only a, a release, but an opportunity to experience a life rather, un, not, not under oppression, but a creative life of service uh, to all humanity. And what more meaning could there be uh, for human beings? Uh, I would say there could not be more than that, that we find ourselves refreshed, creative, ready, open for others uh, in service uh, to other human beings. Jesus is the example of that strong faith, but also that creative, responsive love. And uh, uh, I'm going to go back to a passage that we've quoted a couple of times. I think it's very powerful. I think of the, uh, the time that he is passing through a town, and uh, there's an official there of the synagogue, religious official, says, my daughter needs you, hurry up. And he stops in the middle of the square, and he says, no, there's someone here that needs help as well. And he turns to the woman with a flow of blood and he engages her and he connects with her and he blesses her and he heals her. Uh, <clears throat> that to me is a powerful example of the moment, the present moment. Everyone's saying, no, we got to go. She's dying. The future is <laughs> in danger. Let's hurry. And he says, no, there's something right now, something different that needs to be addressed. Uh, so strong faith. Responsive love, right? Responsive love to this woman. And then also unquestioning hope. They said to him, uh, what about the little girl? And they said, somebody said, the little girl is dead. And uh, basically he said, don't you believe it? There's, uh, there's hope for her as well. And he goes and he lifts her from her deathbed and, uh, and, she, and she lives. So uh, yeah, Jesus himself as, uh, as someone 
who brings an astonishing quality, not just meaning to life, but astonishing quality, a power of meaning to life uh, that, uh, uh, that he represents in all he does as we read the Gospels. And secondly, uh, Jesus is the resurrected one. He, uh, he went to the cross, gave his life, trusted in God the Father uh, that that was not the end. And in his resurrection, uh, according to our uh, theology, according to our scriptures, uh, he is the one who in his resurrection brings life as hope. He brings life um, uh, and, uh, and with it, he brings the future. He brings uh, life as hope and he brings hope as life. Uh, hope becomes a living thing for us as we uh, walk through this world. A phrase from uh, Colossians 1.27, again, Paul uh, says to, to his uh, friends at Colossa, uh, he speaks of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Just the fact that uh, with our understanding that as we accept Jesus into our hearts, he comes and lives with us, that is uh, an overwhelming and ever renewed spring uh, of, of what the present can mean because it, uh, it promises the power of the future as well. And uh, in this regard, uh, let me share uh, a passage from 1 Peter, uh, which I'll take a look at and read. Uh, 1 Peter 13 to 15. Uh, in this letter, Peter is writing to a congregation that is feeling persecution. Uh, their uh, neighbors or their township or their city, whatever it is, has found out that they're Christians and they don't like it. And, uh, and we don't know the level of persecution, but it's uncomfortable. Uh, it probably didn't involve martyrdom at this point, but maybe it involved you know, losing jobs or being shunned uh, and possibly some very other painful things that happen. Um, so he writes to encourage them, and in this point, uh, he, he makes uh, a specific uh, reference to hope and the need uh, for hope. So I'm reading First uh, Peter three thirteen to sixteen, right? And he encourages them, uh, even though people are persecuting them. He says, nevertheless, do good, respond to the evil with good. And this is a, a statement of, of Jesus and Peter is reiterating, do good to those who harm you. So he says this, now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing good and doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their fears. Do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord and always be ready to make your defense to anyone who asks from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Paul is turning the tables on this uh, community that feels uh, defensive and, uh, and they're drawing in. Uh, he says, hang, out, hang in there with the good behavior, <laughs> serve your neighbors, be out there, be with them, be for them, and they'll, they'll understand. People know who is for them and who against, is against them. But he says, even if you uh, suffer for the good that you do, and that happens as well, we all know. Uh, he says, there, there is, that is not without a blessing. That's not without God being with you. So he says, um, do not fear what they fear. He's implying that their persecution is out of fear. Maybe, uh, maybe it's racial, maybe it's uh, social, uh, maybe it's economic. Uh, they, they have nervousness about who you are. Uh, and he says, don't participate in the nervousness. Don't, uh, do, uh, don't do tit for tat. Don't, don't just attack them on, on the same level. Don't fear what they fear. Be someone who has a different kind of hope. 
and don't do intimidate and don't uh, don't, don't be intimidated. But instead, he says, uh, instead of focusing on them and in their uh, their anger and their fear, instead sanctify the Lord as uh, Jesus as Lord in your hearts. He said, come back to the present moment and say, no, Jesus is the Lord. He is the one who controls the moment. And out of that, then out of that, he says, be ready. Don't go out and knock them over the heads and say, you're wrong and I'm right. But when they come to you and say, how can you have a hope? How can you have peace in this particular situation? Tell me about your hope, because all I see around me is fear. Then Paul says, be ready to give an account for the hope that is within you. But do it with gentleness and reverence. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, lots to think about there. Uh, the hope that is within you could almost mean, you know, the, the love or the peace. But um, Peter's contrasting that to the fear of society. And then as Christians or as uh, other kinds of professionals, we can stand uh, against those uh, instinctive fears. And I, I think there's a lot of fear in our society right now. How can we represent something else that looks to the future in a, in a, in a, in a calmer way with some kind of assurance? What is our hope? And just briefly, the last point on the role of prayer. Uh, Philippians 4 says, uh, do not be anxious for anything, uh, but let, in everything let your requests be made known to the Lord, and he will hear you, and he will respond. So there too, uh, how in the moment of anxiety, in the moment of distress, uh, where do we find our hope? Uh, very clearly for, in, in the Christian context, we give it to the Lord and believe that uh, he's gonna do something about it. That's not escapism. That's a return to the reality of the powerful God in the midst of a moment that is distracting us from that love of God. Uh, and so, uh, so Jesus is the hope of the world and, uh, and, and, and the way that functions in Christianity, that's what I'm trying to suggest. Let me uh, make a comment, this is point four, on the article that you'll read in, in relation to, uh, to this lecture. Usually uh, I haven't done that, uh, but I want to uh, this time, um, and maybe uh, it, you can, in your response to the article, you can think about this or respond to, to me as well if you want, or, or you don't have to. But this is, this, this is how I would read and, and ask what some of the issues uh, were that were uh, brought up there. So Green's uh, living in hope and desperate for a miracle. It's a powerful story of a family uh, who have a, has a, they have an infant who is, uh, doesn't look like uh, it's gonna live. But um, they wanna pray for a miracle. And so they prevent uh, care and, uh, and, and, and they insist on the, the lengthening of a life which probably does not have uh, quality. Um, uh, and uh, and it, it's, a, it's a very difficult situation. Uh, what's lifted up in the article is the strong Christian faith of this couple, and yet also the implication is it's a misguided faith because uh, they're not looking at the pain of their child or they're not looking at other circumstances. They're just wanting God to do uh, something that will relieve uh, their suffering and their, their anxiety. Nevertheless, that's not the focus of the article, is it, right? The article is about the dilemma and, and, and the difficulty of the nurses uh, in that situation and how, how can they deal with their own trauma when they see families making what looks like bad decisions uh, rather than uh, really responding to the realities of the moment and, uh, uh, and, and, and go in that way. What is the spiritual challenge in this article, where, where if we're talking about spirituality and ethics. Um, I'm not sure, the reason I'm talking about it is I'm not sure that the article itself uh, is fair on a couple points. I think it assumes uh, that waiting for a miracle is something that uh, is probably not worthwhile doing. 
Uh, I believe in miracles. I've seen miracles. I know they happen, and perhaps you have as well. Perhaps even from a non-religious point, you've seen things happen uh, that are unexplicable, and there's only 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 thing you can do is rejoice, uh, even though that doesn't that doesn't change any protocol, right? That <laughs> that doesn't uh, alter any, uh, any way in which one would uh, uh, address a particular situation and, and attempt to, uh, to alleviate it. Miracles don't change uh, health or medical procedure. Um, I think the spiritual challenge that I read is uh, to what degree is the nurse prepared for that anxiety? And I'm not sure it's picked up in the article. To what degree is the nurse thinking about issues of death and life? To what extent is she understanding that there is hope uh, in that situation, even in what is obvious, in in a very clear sense, a hopeless situation? Uh, What is the meaning there? And how can she, in that context, without disparaging the couple in their religion without disparaging th- them in, in their frustration, how can that nurse be a presence then of hope uh, nevertheless? I don't know the answer. Uh, I don't think any one of us would know the answer unless we were in that situation and we found, found a way, uh, a word to speak or a way to be. Uh, but I think, I'm just saying, I think that's what, uh, what I get out of the article in terms of what, uh, what the challenge uh, that I see. All right, conclusion for uh, the uh, uh, video. Uh, some reiteration, but also just pushing it a little bit. Hope is an extension of faith. Uh, we talked about love, but also so we come to the present moment of faith. We believe in God. We hope for the future. Hope is an extension of faith. And what that means is hope is, uh, is a living and vulnerable entity. Hope goes up and down. And we must allow that to happen in ourselves and in other people. There was a situation, a time when uh, my wife and I were under very extreme circumstances. And I I visited a a friend of my dad's. Uh, She was elderly and uh, uh, she was a minister and in a retirement home. Uh, You know, I went over there to do her a favor because uh, she's uh, old and by herself. (laughs) And I always forgot how much she would give me. Uh, So I went and we talked about it. She said, now, how's your situation? I said, well, it's still, there's no clear answer. Uh, but I believe that the, that the Lord will bring us through. And she looked at me, and I can still remember uh, the, uh, the fierce challenge in her eyes. She says, that's good. If you believe. That's good, if you believe. And I was very glad at that moment that I, in fact, was believing. <laughs> otherwise, it would have struck very deeply that I would say, I'm sure God will take care of it when inside. Uh, I was uh, falling apart. But uh, those things go up and down. Those things need to be reiterated. Our faith, our love, our hope uh, in God, in our community, in, in, in what God gives us today, and we receive it in that way. Or in what our, you know, our human community gives. Uh, let that be a living thing because hope goes up and down. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> and so it's a vulnerable entity. Uh, second point, hope as an outgrowth of love and presence. Just reiterating that, I get, I'm sure you've picked up the point. But again, in the nursing context, how powerful then for there to be <clears throat> someone in the hospital who is looking exactly at that, to what is the present moment, bring reality, bring relationship to the present moment, make the nursing contact if it's going to happen uh, with, a, with a patient, and let the moment speak for itself. Uh, very powerful. Uh, and, uh, uh, and you know that, and I know that, uh, and we don't know every time it happens, but sometimes we hear uh, someone comes back and says, I can't believe uh, your smile just made all the difference. Uh, hope as an outgrowth of love and presence. And the third uh, point, uh, 
which I'm not sure about. So again, this is up to you to, uh, if you think this could be the case, to bring it to the question of ethics in particular. Uh, hope as an ethical challenge. Uh, now, I feel this as a teacher, as, a, uh, as someone who is a religious professional, uh, theology, I'm supposed to stand for the truth of God. Um, I know I'm supposed to bring a good word to people if they ask. Uh, and in that sense, I do feel an ethical responsibility to maintain the fullness of my Christian faith uh, and, and to be aware of it and to be responsible for it. And that includes faith and love and hope. Uh, and so uh, not to just despair with something unless uh, I'm working on it, you know, uh, but to, to be ready with hope. So my question is this. To what extent is the readiness to express hope an ethical imperative for nursing? To what extent do nurses necessarily must be ready uh, to, uh, to bring hope to a situation? I don't know. Is it, is it necessary? And secondly, the question would be, uh, if so, on what basis do we renew that hope? Do we find that hope? Is, do we restore that hope? Is it on the basis of Christian practice and uh, uh, community and uh, all of the things that uh, we know as Christians we should do? Is, a part, is it a part of, if we're not uh, religious or we have another religion, uh, of exploring those realities and values so that, uh, so that we are not in despair, so that we're not giving up and, and imparting the, uh, uh, the, uh, the impression that uh, life ought to be given up on occasionally. Uh, that's my question. Um, I wonder what you think. It's been good to be with you and uh, to have these opportunities to talk with you. And I look forward to uh, your papers uh, on this particular subject. And thank you very much.